And Father God, we do want to thank you, Lord, that you are the way maker, the miracle worker, the light in the darkness, the promise keeper, Lord. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you're always working, Lord. You're always moving and ministering on our behalf the great things of Christ Jesus, Father. And we thank you for the miracle uh, we have through uh, uh, the Internet and through YouTube and the various uh, uh, media uh, resources, Lord God, that we can come uh, before you, Lord, uh, just worshiping you in spirit and in truth this night, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity we gather to just uh, have the spirited time of worship, Lord. And uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for those who are gathered here in our midst in the sanctuary, Lord. We thank you for those watching by, uh, again, via the internet, Lord, uh, this service tonight, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord God, that we as a people can come under the shelter of your wings, looking for your protection and your provision for our lives, Lord. And we, we know that uh, out there in the world, Lord, many people... Uh, going through various things, Lord, with the effects of this COVID pandemic, Lord. Uh, things are turning down, people are shut in, people uh, are going through times of maybe unemployment and financial difficulty, Lord, and kids bouncing off the walls at home, whatever it might be, Lord, uh, additional stress, Lord. Uh, we pray that people might be calling upon you, Lord. And we know that uh, illness and uh, difficulty doesn't take a break just for this COVID, Lord, but uh, things are just exacerbated and multiplied lord and again may you be there lord reaching out and ready to uh, minister lord as uh, uh as we are the church lord we ask that you bless us and use us through the furtherance of your kingdom we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve and to minister lord and to be those missionaries out in the world lord to give a word of hope lord uh, we thank you lord that your your word speaks of uh the apples of gold and setting of silver, Lord, are, are the words uh, fitly spoken, Lord, and like a cup of cold water to a, a, a weary person, Lord, uh, so is the good news of Jesus Christ, Father. So help us to, again, administer the great things of Christ to a world, a world uh, lost without you, lost without your love, lost without the comfort and the hope and the, the love and the joy that can only come from you. Bless us as we study your word this night, Lord. We continue to worship you through the study as you bring encouragement, you touch our hearts and lives, you bring rejuvenation and re-empowering uh, us, Lord, with the great things of Christ Jesus, Father. So we thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, guys, glad that you're here. Glad that we're here tonight. And uh, what a great time of worship and uh we just uh, want to just continue to pray for one another uh, as uh, the Spirit leads. And uh, uh, many, again, affected by the ongoing effects of this pandemic. And even worse yet, the shutdown and the financial ramifications and uh, the things of uh, people being deterred from coming to church and so on. And uh, uh, again, uh, be ready and be, uh, uh, be that prayer warrior in your closet. Be ready out in the neighborhood, out at the supermarket. Uh, at the grocery store, at the bank, to give a word of encouragement uh, to those who look for that hope uh, uh, that can only come in Christ Jesus. But hey guys, last week we left off in uh, Genesis 34. We left off uh, in our study uh, where Jacob's daughter was raped by Shechem. Man, you know, they came back into the land and all of a sudden this young man takes a fancy to her, but uh, not doing it the right way, he went ahead and he raped the, the young uh, uh, Jacob's young daughter Dinah and this uh, this young man seemed to have a genuine feeling for Dinah and asked his father to arrange a marriage between them. He wanted to make it right. He wanted to do the honorable thing although he got started off on the wrong foot and that's you know we explained last week that there's uh, love or, or attraction is no reason uh, uh, to take someone by force but Jacob and his sons uh, consented but only if the men of the, uh, the town were circumcised. And again, that's a that's, uh, symbol of circumcision or the rite of circumcision, just saying that hey, we set apart from the rest of the world. We set apart from the nations. We set apart from the worldly people. And now we uh, want to be set apart uh, unto God. And uh, 
they quickly agreed and they went through the procedure of cutting away the foreskin of the flesh. Quite a painful thing and uh, even to think about it right now, you know, uh, it's very, very uh, hard to fathom that. But in verses 25 and 26, we pick up our study there. Um, all who went to the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, and all uh, who went out to the gate of the city. And uh, now it came about on the third day that when they were in pain, the two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, uh, Dinah's brothers, each took a sword and came upon the city unawares, and they killed every male. Uh, Simeon and Levi took it upon themselves to take revenge upon the men, uh, upon Shechem and his father, uh, Hamor, and, and uh, upon the men of the village, the men of the city, killing them and uh, uh, taking their sister uh, from Shechem's house. You know, she was already given as a bride, it seems, and uh, already living uh, in Shechem's house as a, uh, under, under the covering of the roof, uh, his roof, and under the shelter of his home. Uh, and you know, you, you gotta think that hey, she must have been really uh, uh, traumatized by this also. Here she was, uh, they didn't get off real on the right foot uh, with their relationship, but now, uh, you know, taken into the home as, a, as the wife of this young man, Shechem. And now all of a sudden, her husband for maybe just a few days or a few hours was uh, uh, killed by her brothers. And you know, she was taken from the home, uh, taken away. Uh, Jacob's son came upon, 27, uh, came upon the slain and looted the city and uh, because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and all that there was in the city and all that which, uh, which was in the field and they captured uh, and looted all the wealth and all their, their little ones and their wives, even all that was in their houses. Guys, uh, now the rest of Jacob's son come along and took advantage. They kind of just came and they rolled along with the violence of their two brothers and they said, hey, now we came upon this, uh, this uh, wealth and we took all this stuff for ourselves. Uh, all that was in their houses, they took advantage to loot the city of its wealth and all its possessions, their herds and flocks and all the wealth, including the women and children. All that they had, uh, they took for themselves. Uh, uh, um, and uh, so Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble to me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and my men being few in number, they will quickly come together against me. And uh, uh, they will attack me and I will be destroyed, I and my household. And they said, should we treat our sister as a harlot? And Jacob uh, was grieved, guys, and I'm sure not only of the theft, but because of the kin killing of innocent uh, men. And you know, just the thing of the looting and the robbing, the killing, something so heinous. And uh, they could only justify themselves that, hey, should we stand by even our si as our sister was treated as a harlot? And uh, again, you know, one wrong was, uh, was uh, countered by many, many wrongs of, uh, as these men murdered and robbed and looted. The killing of innocent lives, his son's attitude was one of cold callousness. And they just said, hey dad, this is how it is, man. We're taking revenge. They treated our sister badly and we're doing this in return to them. Um, Jacob said, uh, God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to the God who appeared uh, to God who appeared to you when you, were, you fled from your brother Esau. Now God responds to the situation, directing Jacob to arise and go. And you know, uh, I, I give credit uh, to Jacob for this because he hears the voice of the Lord. The Lord just simply saying, yeah, arise from this place, get up, get ready and go. And uh, <laughs> go to Bethel. And Bethel seems to be a place where, <laughs> where Jacob goes when he's in trouble. He goes to the house of God, Bethel meaning house of God, and uh, uh, he says that when you fled from your brother Esau, remember when he fled from his brother Esau, he really felt that his life was in jeopardy, his brother was going to kill him. He ran for his life really, and you know, as he came to Bethel, he had that meeting with God, and he came face to face with God, and God, uh, God says, hey, now go back and uh, live there and, and make an altar 
there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother. Now he's in trouble. He goes again to the house of God. Uh, so Jacob said to his household, put away all uh, who were with him, uh, to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods which you... Uh, are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, his word to his household was put away these foreign gods. And apparently along the way, they picked up a few souvenirs. They picked up a few knickknacks. They picked up a few little idols, a few little gods that really uh, became these little gods. And they, uh, who knows, maybe because of the people of the land, maybe because of their neighbors, they went somewhere, they went to a worship service with their neighbor, whatever it might have been. Uh, along the way, they picked up some of this stuff and uh, these little images of foreign gods. And he says, put these away, purify yourselves, wash yourselves and cleanse the filth of the flesh away and really it's the filth of the spirit and it's like that washing and the cleansing you know uh, like like paul says hey we're we're cleansed we're washed as if by the water of the word of God, you know, he, he wrote to the Ephesians. And, you know, that's why I think the, the word is so important to us because it not only ministers to us, it instructs us, instructs us it corrects us, it brings us into the right-hearted relationship with the Lord, but it, again, it washes away the filth of the world. And he says, purify yourselves, cleanse the filth of the flesh and the filth of the spirit. And... Uh, and the world which so easily clings to us. And I think that that's where that washing of the, uh, the feet came about, as Jesus washed the feet of his, uh, of his disciples. It says that, hey, you in this world, uh, the, the dust and the dirt and the muck and the mire, you're going through this world, and daily you need to come, and daily you need, hey, Lord, wash me, cleanse me, fill me afresh with your spirit. Because there's so many things that, are, uh, that jump out on us, and there's so many things of our own flesh that, you know, we react out of the flesh, and you know, I, I'm so glad that you know I listened to some of the teachers on K Light, and the most spiritual guys, the leaders of uh, the Calvary chapels, and and they saying that, oh man, I really blew it out on the freeway this day, or I, I had that crossword with my wife, and I said, hey, Pastor Don, even you too, you know, <laughs> and uh, but it's 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 just a thing of of the flesh, and he says, uh, are these things so easily. Uh, work in us and cling to us the filth of the world. He says, uh, change your garments, he says. And Isaiah, you know, said it right. He said that uh, uh, all of our own righteous uh, uh, righteous acts are like filthy rags. And, you know, sometimes we, 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 we want to try and be good. We act good. People tell us, hey, be good. And they know that we're not good. But yet uh, they cannot recognize that hey, the only goodness, the only good one is the goodness of Jesus Christ. He's the... There's one who's good and only, only one who's good, and it's Jesus. Uh, but he says, put away those righteous acts like filthy rags. And, uh, uh, but instead, he says, put on the garments of praise. You know, that's in Isaiah 61.3. And that's one of the songs that we used to sing quite a bit, put on the garments of praise. And, you know, the garments of praise really speak of the great riches of the worship of God, the worship of Jesus Christ. Paul would make the same, uh, 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 would write the same to the Ephesians and to the Colossians, put on Christ, he said this time. And that word to put on is like the putting on of a garment. So it's exactly what the Lord was uh, saying here. Purify yourselves, change your garments, put on Jesus Christ is the real thing uh, that he's telling his uh, his household and his party. And he says, let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make an altar there to the God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. You know, Jacob, to his credit, he just really uh, admits it. Uh, he makes this very important statement. God answered me. God heard me in the sincerity of my cry to him. God, I know God, God, you heard me. You, you, uh, you rescued me in the day of my distress and, um, and uh, you have been with me. You know, he recognized every step of the way God was with him. And uh, sometimes we don't act like it. Sometimes we don't, uh, 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 exude all the good things of Jesus Christ out in that world. But, you know, as we, we take one step at a time, I, I think it's uh, 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 Proverbs 21 where it says, 
the slow, steady plotting of the righteousness uh, brings uh, brings great success. You know, it's, it's something to that effect. I'm just paraphrasing that. But the Living Bible said the slow, steady plotting uh, brings uh, brings much uh, a success in the world. And you know, the uh, the thing of uh, plotting, you know, we're not r running a great race. We're not doing a 50-yard dash. We're not even doing a, a mile run, but we're doing the marathon. And sometimes the greatest guys that they always applaud on the marathon are the ones that, you know, haven't run it in a real quick pace, but they're just kind of plodding along. And at times, uh, you know, in the afternoon, I'm watching people jogging and uh, uh, in, in the afternoon, I'm kind of taking a break because I'm out of gas after a couple laps, just walking. And you watch these guys jo uh, jogging along. Some of them have such steady paces, they make it look like Man, it's no trouble at all. They have such a nice steady pace and they just keep going and they go back and forth and they run laps. And other guys, they really look like they fall, they're going to fall headlong because they're, they're running along, but they're really struggling. And I think that, you know, I can plod along. I plod along on my few laps around the block and that's about as best I can do. But I can just trust a hey, God is as I plod along in this world, I'm looking you, you, you to bless my walk and my, my uh, righteousness. Even though we, uh, we got to take a break at times or whatever it might be, we trip up. Uh, God is saying uh, that uh, uh, to continue on. I have, uh, he says, God answered me in the day of my distress. He's been with me wherever I have gone. And you're going to hope uh, and think that hey, Jacob was led by the Lord and directed by the Lord. And the same thing, we got to say, Lord, uh, I hope that I'm directed by you and led by you in all that I do, a very poignant, poignant statement he makes to, uh, uh, to the family, a statement of faith. He's saying that a God is the one who's kept us all this way. He's acting as the leader, as the chief of his family, and uh, really, um, he's saying we're, we've got all this blessing and have, all, have had all this protection and provision because God has been with us. You know, he makes that statement. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods, verse 4, which they had, they had <coughs> and the rings which they had in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the uh, oak, which was near Shechem. Then they journeyed there. There was a great terror among the, upon the cities which were around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Uh, they put away all these little idols, guys, and the earrings. I guess uh, the, the, the earrings were a symbol that, that says, hey, man, I'm a... I'm a slave or I'm a bond servant. You know, it, it wasn't that their ear was pierced uh, like a bond slave or a bond servant of God, but their ear was pierced by maybe some piece of little jewelry, some piece of silver or piece of gold that says, hey, I belong to this Baal, this foreign God. And the same thing with the little idols. Remember uh, uh, um, the, the guy in Ephesus who made those little silver shrines, he made quite a good living. And even in the time of uh, the Roman Empire and the Christians within the Roman Empire, eh, the idol worship was a big, big thing. And it was the same here back in uh, this day. And, and even today, uh, we might say that, hey, I don't bow down in front of no golden statue. But, you know, there are those who do. And uh, maybe we have our own little idols that we set up in our hearts. And, uh, you know, we talked about this and that and motorcycles and so on and so forth. It could even be people, but uh, 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 they put all these little idols uh, and left them behind. You know, they said, we're burying them into the deepest part of the land and we're never coming back for them. As they passed on, God brought, a, uh, brought about a fear uh, within the peoples of the land and they dare not to pursue. You know, God had somehow said that, hey, don't, don't you dare touch my people because, you know, the consequences are going to come down hot and heavy on you. So there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them. Jacob came to Luz, and uh, that is Bethel, uh, where, uh, which is the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, uh, because there God had revealed himself to him when he had fled from his brother. Uh, El Bethel, or the God of Bethel, he's saying, hey, this is where I had my first meeting with God. This is where I come to renew my relationship. This is where I come, God, to seek direction and to seek inspiration from you. And uh, again, asking you to make my way, uh, make you 
uh, asking you to make the, my way, the way for me out in this world. He says, you know, you have been with me through the good and the bad times, the times of distress, and you have gone, uh, you have been with me wherever I've gone. And he says, I want to come, I want to worship you. And uh, uh, there he built that altar. In verse 8, now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died, and she was buried below Bethel under uh, the oak, and it was named Alun Bakuth, or Oak of Weeping. Oak of Weeping. Deborah must have been uh, particularly close to Rebecca. It was a particularly hard time. And, you know, um, at, at times... Uh, I don't know what the real significance is, but it must have been a real hallmark in the life of Rebecca that this close person uh, to her uh, had been taken away, and it was a place of real weeping. It was a place uh, that uh, we uh, went through difficult times. And you know, uh, today, guys, many people go through difficult times. Uh, uh, I was just sharing with one of the brothers earlier that a guy, uh, I had asked him about his brother-in-law, and he just told me, yeah, I can't speak about my brother and I cannot speak about this right now. And then after a little while, we were uh, in private together. He said, now I can tell you that hey, my brother-in-law's gone. You know, July 21st, uh, uh, he took his own life. And uh, without warning, without any kind of apparent rhyme or reason, uh, he was just gone. And, you know, uh, he was uh, particularly shaken because I think that he was uh, probably one of uh, very close with his brother-in-law. But he was very disturbed because his wife... Uh, was particularly just uh, so shaken and traumatized by this act. And you know, the ripple effect among the guy's wife, among the guy's kids, and even for this guy's daughter, who was uh, very close to her cousins and, and so on and so forth, but reaching so far. And um, you know, during this time, I don't know what it was. If it might have been, hey, we get it, we have everything. We have all this money, I have this job, and you know, I have this family. and. Yet I have a little existing conditions and, you know, I can't enjoy myself and do this and that because I can't travel. But, you know, I, 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 that's it. You know, I'm out of here and just boom. With, uh, with, uh, uh, in one moment he was gone, you know, a life taken. And, you know, the people dealing with the effects and maybe uh, this, it, it's similar to this. I'm sure the conditions weren't the same, but Rebecca's heart was broken. And people's hearts are broken. And I, my, my own self, my, my heart was broken because I felt the guy's pain like he had lost a friend. And uh, he, it was so sudden, it was so unexpected that um, he said that, oh, the guy had a lot more good years in front of him. And all of a sudden, boom. But again, uh, we can only trust that God is the one moving. God is the one ministering. And as I said that, you know, even with this COVID pandemic, all these things don't take a break. The emotional stress that people have, the things of other people going through surgery and other things of medical procedures and so on and so forth. These are only just exacerbated because, hey, now I don't have a job and, you know, how do we make it? You know, what do we do? And uh, uh, I think the, the harvest, uh, the fields are white for harvest, guys. And the Lord is, uh, the Lord is looking and he's moved within his inward parts and he's saying, you know, uh, beseech therefore the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers uh, because the fields are, are white for harvest. The, 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 the harvest is plenteous, but the workers are few. So we got to be ready to be challenged and to take a step of faith and uh, share a bit of love and hope of Jesus Christ that only he can bring. Verse 9, he goes, God appeared to Jacob again. He came from Padana Ram and he blessed him. And uh, uh, the Lord was very, um, was very interested in Jacob, guys, now appearing to him again. Not only that, but he blessed Jacob. And he said to him in 10, God said to him, uh, your name is Jacob, and no longer shall you be called uh, uh, Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And uh, several chapters back in verse uh, chapter 32, when Jacob was left alone in his camp before crossing over uh, and meeting a uh, meeting with his brother Esau. Uh, he was left alone in his camp and a man appeared to him and wrestled with him all, all the night long until daybreak. And you know, uh, here it is, Jacob's wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And uh, uh, we remember that the man uh, told him uh, that his name would be no longer be Jacob, but he would be called Israel. Uh, or one who strives with God. We commented that certain scholars also translated Israel 
uh, Israel as prince or leader among the nations. And I, when I read that, and I read it several times over and over, and I said, gee, I like that, uh, that thought, that the word Israel is a derivative of the, uh, of the word prince or leader among the nations. And uh, I, I think that Israel uh, is that leader among the nations. He's a prince among the nations of the world, guys. And uh, 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 we continue to pray for the, the peace of Israel. We continue to pray and to support. And I, I love it that our last, uh, our administration have, has been so favorable to is, uh, Israel. And I, I hope and pray that whoever uh, is in charge of our nation, we would continue to see the value of being a friend to Israel, that those who bless you will be blessed, those who curse you will be cursed. And we, we see that uh, coming through time and time again. Uh, thus the Lord called him Israel, guys, and all. Uh, uh, 11, God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. Uh, the land which I gave to Abram and Isaac, I will give to you. I will give the land to your descendants after you. God also commands them to be fruitful and multiply. And we already see that he's got quite a few kids, man, and uh, he's been very fruitful so far. But he's, I, I think that... Uh, that uh, the command is the fruitfulness, uh, not, on, not only to Israel, but to all of his, uh, his descendants after him, that they would continue to proliferate and to become a, an even greater nation in numbers and, uh, and in strength. The promise uh, to him was a nation, or Israel, uh, or, or Israel will, will come from uh, him and also multiply a great company of nations would come forth from him. A great company of nations would come forth from him. The promise also was for the land, guys. And uh, the land given to and promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, now Israel, and for their descendants. The land, was, the Lord was saying that this land is your inheritance. This land is for you and for your descendants forever. It's not something to be taken away of. It's not something to be brokered away. It's not something that other peoples would come and claim the land. And uh, uh, this is exactly what's happening. We've tried to uh, parcel up pieces of the land. We've tried to give, in, give back pieces of land. Uh, uh, if we give you this land, will you be nice to Israel? No, we, don't, we won't because uh, they don't deserve to live and we want to push them right out into the ocean. And it's not something that can be uh, traded away or bartered away. It's not somebody for, for a, a nation like Great Britain or the United States or whoever it might be a great world leader to come in and say that it hey, will give you some of the land if you just leave Israel alone. It's not that. The land was promised. The land is an inheritance to the, the, the children of Israel, guys. It's not something, again, to be brokered away or given away or bartered as a peace offering because it's never going to bring peace uh, with those who hate Israel and who want to destroy the little nation of Israel. Verse 13, God went up with him in the place where he had spoken uh, with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken uh, with him, a pillar of stone. He poured a drink offering on it, and he also poured oil on it. And so Jacob named the place where God had spoken to him, Bethel, or house of God. And, and we've seen in the last few chapters that this, uh, this place, Bethel, uh, is quite a, uh, is, has been named quite a few times, and there's a great significance to it, guys. Uh, God, God left and Jacob set up that monument like he was told. He poured out uh, drink offerings and, and the offerings of the oil, really as an act of worship. Again, reminded uh, that this place was the house of God. And I was, you know, really thinking, hey, what, what is the house of God? What is it symbolic of? And we know that we're in a place of worship tonight and Many, uh, many churches meet in buildings and places of worship, uh, whether they might be old Safeways or old uh, theaters, or maybe we, we've had the opportunity and the fortune to be blessed and build a standalone uh, a place. Or maybe we've, ch we've been chased out of here, chased out of there, because we just, uh, 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 you know, uh, things uh, are, are dynamic and on the move. And here we are here tonight in the... Uh, uh, right here in the, uh, on the edge of Chinatown. And uh, 
uh, we're worshiping in this place. But the, the Lord reminded, uh, reminded me of uh, the verse out of 2 Corinthians 6.16, where we're told that we are the temple of the living God. You know, like Bethel, the house of God. We might call ourselves Bethel, Bethel Eric, Bethel Hank, Bethel Richard, you know, because we're the house of the living God. The God, the, 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 the God lives within uh, uh, these temples, the temples of our body, guys. We are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He now dwells within us. No longer are we to set up altars or monuments uh, in external situations, anything like that. Uh, uh, but we are, uh, uh, we are Bethel, the house of God now, the Hale the temple of the living God, guys. And I, I thought that, wow, that's so profound that uh, it's not a place, it's not a monument, it's not an altar, but really it's the, uh, the Lord enthroned on the seat of our heart. And you know, b before, uh, uh, it, it was always, hey, who's seated on the throne of your heart? I think it was the four spiritual laws that always illustrated, uh, you could have self on the throne of your heart, or you can have the Lord occupy the throne of your heart, his rightful place. And I think that as we've, uh, we've come to that place of saying, Lord, uh, take your seat on the throne of my heart, we become the temple of the living God. No longer again worshiping at altars or monuments, but uh, again, God, uh, uh, God in us, the hope of glory, guys. God in us, the hope of glory. Where these earthen vessels are, uh, filled with precious treasures of the Lord. Uh, uh, verse 16, uh, And when they had journeyed from Bethel, and there was still some distance to go to Ephra, uh, Ra uh, Rachel began to give birth and uh, suffered severe labor. And when she was in severe labor, the midwife said, uh, said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. Hey, here's this poor lady. She's really suffering, going through the the throes of childbirth. And uh, I was reading one study uh, uh, a book, uh, uh, a Bible handbook that said that in Egypt, uh, about 90% of the children uh, died uh, uh, right shortly after childbirth. And I think that probably, you know, a good amount of the ladies who were giving birth also died because of complications in childbirth. Uh, they said that uh, if, uh, uh, to have the child and the mother good at childbirth, eh, that was a great thing. But if you could just get your child to 30 days or a month old, they felt that chances were good that your child would survive. It's not like we here in the United States today where it seems that eh, every, Afro, uh, every child that's born seems to, uh, a lot of them seem to survive, not unless there's some real... Uh, uh, dramatic uh, physical difficulties or challenges. But uh, because of complications, we mitigate all these complications with all the surgical techniques techniques, and all the aid that we have. Uh, the childbirth is, is, is not as challenging as it, was, uh, as it was then. But you know, back in that day, as difficult as childbirth uh, would have, uh, could have been, guys, the midwife uh, assisting Rachel uh, reassured her uh, with the good news that uh, she had uh, born another son. You know, all, amidst all the pain, amidst all the suffering, she gave him, uh, she gave this lady the good news that, hey, you got another son. That's like reason to celebrate. Uh, so important in this culture was the birth of children, but especially male children. And you know, it wasn't that uh, I think the Israelites were prejudiced or the people in that time and age were uh, prejudice against girls. Uh, but it was, it was a thing that a male children meant that your family lineage would continue on. Male children would say that uh, you had help out in the fields with the flocks and the herds and so on. Male children would be the one uh, uh, taking care of our, uh, the elderly parents or grandparents uh, as time went on. And uh, these things uh, was very important. Uh, Unfortunately, we've heard the stories of where, you know, in parts in the, the East and so on and so forth, when, uh, when a girl was born, a lot of times they gave the girl away or they left her out because they wanted a male son. They wanted a male child. They didn't want that female child. Um, 
Uh, but, uh, you know, the Bible does say that sons are like arrows in the hands of a warrior, Psalm 127. But in the same token, uh, uh, the, 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 the psalmist wrote that children are like olive plants surrounding the parent, uh, surrounding the parent tree. You know, it picks, paints a, a beautiful picture of kids around the parents. And uh, 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 Jewish couples greatly accepted, gladly accepted either boy or girl, guys. The Jews revered life and considered children as a blessing from God. Other cultures, like the Amorites guys, they worship God, their God Molech, by offering up their children as burnt offerings. And you know, you can find that in 2 Kings 23.10. And as heinous as, as heinous as it sounds, you know, uh, um, they, they revered their God to a point of saying that, hey, we're offering up our kid on this altar of sacrifice before you, Molech. And uh, what a horrible thing it is, yeah. But I think that uh, uh, we've offered up 50 or 60 million children right here in the United States uh, to the altar and to the God of pleasure and convenience. And uh, uh, it's not a good time, or I can't afford to take off, I can't do this. And oh, it was just a, mo a one night stand, and I can't have this child. And uh, on, on that altar of convenience, that altar of sexual pleasure and sexual immorality we've uh, we've offered up you know millions of children in the name of again pleasure and convenience uh, uh, 18 goes and it came up on her say uh, her soul was departing from her for she died that she named him ben oni and his father called him benjamin and uh, so rachel died and was buried on the way to ephra that is bethlehem so again uh uh, the Ben Oni uh, really is the son of my sorrow, the son of my sorrow, and Rachel apparently in her own sorrow, uh, and anticipation of her own death, guys, uh, called the baby the son of my sorrow. And what a sad thing it is, yeah. I think that um, uh, most mothers would think that, oh, I'm so filled with joy, even though I'm having such a hard time. They'll be so blessed and so happy that, hey, I got a son, I got a kid, and he, you know, he's okay. I'm not okay, but uh, this is what it is. And uh, she called that baby boy the son of my sorrow. But Jacob clearly saw uh, another future for this young baby, guys, uh, a bright hope for this child, and call him the son of my right hand. In other words, he'll be by my side with me. This one will be, you know, precious in my sight, and he'll be right with me. And uh, uh, even as he loved his wife, Rachel, uh, he loved this child, uh, this special child uh, that she had gifted him with, the Lord had gifted uh, them with. And uh, even as uh, she passed on, she left a little bundle of joy. Uh, in 20, uh, Jacob set up a pillar over a grave, and that is the pillar of Rachel's uh, grave to this day. And then Israel journeyed on uh, and on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it came about that Israel was dwelling in the land that Reuben went out and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and, and Israel heard about it. What a shameful thing yeah, to have uh, your son lay with your concubine. And uh, But here uh, it's, it's interesting that right now we see that changing of the name. It's kind of like when Saul became Paul. Now we see Jacob becoming Israel. And uh, we see that transitional, uh, this transitional section of uh, uh, the scripture where his name is being called uh, from Jacob to Rachel. And uh, 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 moving along, uh, uh, we end this portion of scripture where we take uh, uh, with the sons. Uh, where we, we see uh, a tale of... Uh, a son's fleshly deed as his uh, sexual relations with his father's concubine. You know, we, we think that what in the world is this Reuben doing? But what in the world is concubine? We hear that word concubine quite a bit. And, uh, but the concubine may be defined as, uh, as a wife who is not legally a wife. While having certain rights, their children were, con were considered legitimate. They weren't in illegitimate children if you were a concubine of such and such a guy like Richard or whatever it is, but you're considered legitimate. They could, they could be divorced. They could be a source of trouble. We've seen that. And uh, uh, 
But, but as for the Christian guys, this lifestyle was completely uh, incompatible with the teaching of the Bible. It really goes back to Genesis 2.24. Where the Lord, uh, when the Lord uh, instituted the the um, institution of marriage, guys, you know, He simply said uh, in uh, two twenty four, He says, uh, "For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to the, his wife, and they should become one flesh." And the man and his wife were both naked. They were not ashamed. Guys, you know, the thing was, God never meant it that they would have multiple wives or multiple concubines. I know that uh, it, it was something that, you know, it, it, it may have happened to help uh, multiply the, the families and so on and so forth. But along with the multiplication of children and men, the many sons and the many kids came the many problems where, you know, you saw the strife within the home. We saw that strife between Rachel and Leah. We saw the strife uh, with uh, Hagar and uh, 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 Rebecca. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real thing that uh, the jealousy, the strife, the competing, and so on and so forth, so forth was, uh, uh, was, was really, really bad, guys. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to end the study tonight. We'll pick up uh, with the sons of Israel next week. Uh, as we go through the listing of the 12 sons of Jacob or the 12 sons of Israel. Why don't we pray? Father God, we do want to thank you for this evening, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the great thing and the great God that you are, Lord, and the things of the, con the professing of faith in, uh, in God, Lord, by the man Jacob, Lord God. And he says, you've been with me, you've, you've led me, and all this way. And uh, he became a witness to his family. He became a witness uh, to his wives and to his children and concubines and so on and so forth. And uh, it, it be became a, a time of commitment. It became a time that, that Jacob became a new man uh, in, in the Lord. And uh, we thank you for the, 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 the born-again hope that we have in Christ Jesus, Father, as we've come before you and uh, we've committed our lives to you, Lord. And we've asked for that washing and that cleansing, Lord. And you've clothed, clothed us with the robes of righteousness, Lord, the garments of praise, Lord. And you directed us to put Christ on, Father. And we thank you for that, Lord. And <clears throat> we thank you for the work that you've done in and, uh, in and through us and the work that you continue as you lead us in this world, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we are told that Jacob heard your voice, Lord. And we pray that our ears might always be attuned to all that you have for us as you speak to us, as you minister to us through your word, and as you impress upon our hearts the leading and the moving of your spirit, Father, as we surrender our lives to you. We thank you ahead of time for what you're doing, Lord God, and we do pray, Lord God, O Maranatha, do come, Lord, but really, truly, not until the last one is saved, Father. We thank you, we praise you for your faithfulness and love, Lord, and we do ask you move and you minister richly uh, before and, uh, in, and in the midst of your people, Lord, during these uh, times that we live in. We look towards you for your leading, your guiding, your strength, your protection, and your provision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. <laughs>